Al-Andalus was a very different place in the year 1041. The mighty caliphate was no more, abolished ten years before. It had fractured into a myriad of smaller entities known as the taifas, which were essentially Muslim city-states. Now, we're going to get into the Taifa period in more detail in the next podcast, but suffice it to say that these states began to fight with one another for supremacy almost immediately. But in many cases, it wasn't just for military supremacy. Sometimes it was for cultural supremacy. Much like these city-states of Renaissance Italy, they would entice artists and scholars to their respective courts investing vast sums of money into the creation of public works and palaces. If a person was smart enough, they could adjust this to their benefit. Samuel Ibn Nagrila was such a man. He was a Jew born in 993 during the last breath of the caliphate, but in the chaotic years that followed, his family joined the exodus from Cordoba, which had by then become a very dangerous place, and instead, settled in the south in Malaga. He came to the attention of the king of Granada, Habus al-Muzaffar, for his literary brilliance and was promoted up the ranks. When the king died, Samuel just happened to back up the right son named Badis in the ensuing struggle for the throne, and as a result was rewarded by becoming vizier and also commander of the new king's armies. Some historians argue that this was proof of convivencia, but as Morera points out, and rather correctly, this was a rare thing indeed. In fact, the law of the Islamic states was such that no Jew, or for that matter Christian, could hold high office. This law was changed for Samuel, and he was indeed the exception rather than the rule. The man went on to lead the new king's armies in several successful campaigns, but aside from being a politician, a vizier, a general, and a linguist, he was best remembered for his poetry. And why was this so? Well, it was in the Taifa period that the Jewish community began to really experience a cultural rebirth. Samuel, despite all of his other responsibilities, would go on to become the Nagid, the leader of that Jewish community, and showed in his writing that Hebrew, like the preceding Arabic, could be used to express human qualities other than just the religious. And the best part was, his distinctly Andalusian voice encouraged others to do the same. Maria Menachal eloquently puts this into perspective, quote, Only in exile in the taifas in that less stable and more adventurous world was Arabic's challenge to Hebrew finally taken up in earnest. At the core of the matter were the fundamental questions of what poetry was for, and the revolution in Hebrew was based precisely on the Andalusian Jews' profound appreciation for the tolerance and openness of the universe of Arabic poetry. Hebrew was redefined and cultivated as a language that could transcend the devotional and theological uses to which it had lately been limited. It was once again used as the language of a vibrant, living poetry that we call secular on the other side of the divide that was the exile from the Cordoban Caliphate, the Jewish community rediscovered the long-masked aspects of their own heritage, and they came to believe that the language of their God, like the language of the Muslims, which they had long since shared and continued to share, should be enough to transcend mere prayer." End quote. Some historians refer to this as the beginning of the Jewish Golden Age in Spain. But tough times were indeed ahead. Only 25 years later, in 1066, the same year that Norman armies were crossing the English Channel and conquering England, massive anti-Jewish riots would occur in Granada, slaughtering not just hundreds, but thousands. About 50 years later, change was coming from the northern Christian kingdoms. Alfonso VI had an upbringing which gave him a very unique perspective on Al-Andalus, and as a direct result, would make him a very unique ruler. He was the son of the king of Castile Leon, and when his father died, the kingdom was divided between Alfonso and his two brothers. However, his brother Sancho managed to seize his inheritance and exiled him to the south. As it turned out, 
deep into the heart of Moorish Spain. With little alternative, Alfonso went to the city of Toledo. Toledo at this point had become a dominant Taifa state, only rivaled by Seville. She was a prosperous, wealthy, and relatively tolerant city where Muslims, Jews, and Christians coexisted to one extent or another. The ruler of the city, a man named Al-Mamun, took in the destitute Alfonso, even going so far as to protect him from his brother. Alfonso's time in the city exposed him to a completely new way of life. It was no longer just a Christian-based institution. Now, whether there was convivencia or not, the man took a liking to the multicultural society that surrounded him. In fact, he made himself right at home. While all of this was going on, Sancho, who was Alfonso's brother, if you recall, the man who took his land, soon died. Some say that Alfonso may have had a hand in this, but nobody could prove anything. But with the throne of Castile Leon now open, Alfonso took advantage of the situation and returned to the north to reclaim his crown. Several years would pass as he consolidated his holdings. But meanwhile, back in Toledo, the ruler Al-Mamun died, and he was succeeded by his grandson Al-Qadir. But this new ruler had many enemies, including his arch-nemesis and rival Muslim Taifa state, Seville. Before long, he found his situation was completely unsustainable. Al-Qadir called to Alfonso for help, and the Christian king acknowledged and came down to become Toledo's protector. However, internal rivals in the city began to spring up, and in 1084, Al-Qadir had to make a deal. He offered Toledo to Alfonso in exchange for getting him out of the city and allowing him to settle in exile in Valencia. Once again, Alfonso came to his aid and laid siege to the city, but in the spring of 1085, the inhabitants allowed Alfonso to take over. Not a single drop of blood was shed. Maria Menacol astutely takes up the story. Quote, Alfonso, who had first lived in Toledo while it was a taifa, and who had only ever lived in the world of taifas with their promiscuous intermingling of the three religions and their mixed languages and cultures, kept Toledo as the sort of open city that he knew and loved, even as many of the older taifas became more closed or hostile to Jews and to Christians. After the momentous turn of events of 1085, Toledo became the most important city for many of those Arabicized Jews and Christians. End quote. At this point in history, Toledo also became an important place for Christianity as well. Menachal again, quote, Toledo began to fill up with the ever larger communities of the sort that had made Umayyad Cordoba so culturally complex. In 1088, Alfonso supervised Toledo's ascendance in the larger Christian sphere, ensuring that his new capital was declared the principal see of the church in the Iberian Peninsula. Toledo, virtually overnight, went from being a Muslim taifa that few Christians from beyond its borders would have reason to visit, to an archiepiscopal center that conversely few among the church hierarchy could afford not to visit. End quote. Alfonso would go on to rule for a really long time. Toledo, as Menachal mentioned, became his capital, and in time, an ever more luminous city. She had vast libraries, elaborate synagogues, and was a fertile ground for artistry and architecture in an Islamic Goth fusion style known as Mudahar. Important schools that were dedicated to the translation of this repository of knowledge, back into Latin as it would turn out, came into being and helped spread this information to the rest of Christian Europe. Now let's put all of this to the side just for a second. There's a very interesting legacy that's hidden in one of the high points of the city. So, if you go there today, there's a church that you need to see. It was built about a hundred years after Alfonso VI by his descendants and is known as the Church of San Ramon. It's now a museum dedicated to Visigoth culture, but when you enter, you have to pass through horseshoe arches that are adorned in the Umayyad red and white stripes. Inside, there are more arches that are inscribed in Latin with the icon of saints. However, if you look up the elegant windows, they have Arabic inscriptions. Now, this wasn't a mistake, and this wasn't a mosque that at one time was converted, but rather, it was a church built by the lineage of Alfonso VI as a place of worship. 
but at the same time, it's an homage to the Umayyads that had once ruled the land and perhaps can even be interpreted as a sign of reverence to a time when these religions coexisted within the same city. The conquest of Toledo in 1085, and I say conquest with quotes, started a reaction. The Taifas, feeling threatened, called for help from their North African neighbors, the Almoravids. In 1086, the Almoravids brought their armies and also their more orthodox religion. They were later followed by the Almohads with their even more fundamental view on Islam. Tolerance was becoming more and more the exception. It was only 10 years after Toledo was taken that Pope Urban II launched the First Crusade. Of course, he didn't actually call it a crusade, but rather an armed pilgrimage to retake Jerusalem. But the idea of fighting Saracens was becoming state policy. Approximately a hundred years after that, the rather ironically named Pope Innocent III continued this belligerent attitude by condoning further military actions, both internally and externally as it would turn out. The Islamic Christian world was heading into the time of the Crusades, and this was going to be a rough time for everyone. Dario Morera, in his book, The Myth of the Andalusian Paradise, emphasizes that the examples that I've given you don't count towards convivencia, that they are, in the end, hand-picked specimens that show the exceptions rather than the rule, that these people were the elites, and to take these vignettes at face value would be like figuring out the wants and needs of rank-and-file American society based on the biographies of Hollywood stars and the uber illiterati. Morera goes on to say that in reality most of Al-Andalus lived under a harsh Islamic rule, where the three major religions coexisted but had as little to do with one another as possible, unless necessity demanded it. Hmm, you know, so be it, he's got a point. You don't have to go any further than all the revolts that Al-Andalus had, even during her heyday, or how quickly the Umayyad Caliphate was destroyed to see where he's coming from. But at the same time, I will say this, the vignettes, the samples that I've given you, are only a fraction of what's actually out there. And if we are to ignore them, then there would be a lot to ignore. Dear listener, I leave it up to you to decide whether this was convivencia or not. <laughs>